Since I started my exploration of quilt history, I have begun to realize how textiles have truly shaped the world, not just as an economic and utilitarian commodity, but also as an art form. Today's guest, Young Min Lee, is a textile artist from California, and we will be discussing the beautiful Korean art of Bojagi and its similarities and differences to quilting. So grab your sewing and a cup of tea, and here is my interview with Young Min Lee. Hello, Young Min. Thank you very much for being on the show. Whereabouts are you coming to us from? I am in Pleasanton, which is San Francisco Bay Area in California. When did you realize you were a maker? Ever since I was a very little kid, I was playing with something with my hands. It can be paper, it can be a piece of fabric, it can be a piece of yarn or thread. In early age, I thought I knew that I'm a maker and I have to live with something to make. My mother, she is an avid knitter before she started painting. So I grew up watching her making things with her hands and I was always fascinated and I wanted to do something like her. Is there a tradition of handicrafts in your home? So you said your mother was a knitter. How about your grandmother? My grandparents, uh, they owned a tailoring business when they were young. Maybe my mother was influenced by her parents, but also she made um, simple garments for me and my sister. And eventually she turned into a painter. So she is a maker and she has to use her hands. And I think I got that gene from my grandparents and my mother. And when did you start with Bujagi? I took some courses when I was in college back in Korea. I majored clothing and textile. And one of the courses uh, that I took was Korean costume history and making. And part of that course, um, I was introduced to Hojagi making and I liked it, but I didn't do much back then. Things happened when I moved to California several years after later. I came here with uh, my husband and my uh, newborn baby daughter. At the beginning, it was temporarily, but um, it ended up getting longer than we thought. And I had to make something. And the bujagi just came to me one day. It's very comfortable thing to me to start with. And that reminded me of my home and country and culture that I missed a lot. So it was very naturally connected to me. So was there a community of Bojagi artists in the San Francisco area when you started? Or did you just grab from what you remembered? I just grabbed a um, piece of fabrics and thread and started making Bojagi. But gradually interest um, grew around the community. And now I see some people and I have some um, good friend who does Bajagi too. So for the people that don't know, I get often get confused because Bajagi is both the art of wrapping and a type of sewing. So Bajagi is a thing that can wrap, cover, carry, store things. It's a wrapping cloth. Making bojagi can be bojagi. Nowadays, a lot of people are practicing and demonstrating and using bojagi as a tool to wrap things. So bojagi art is a new term that many people use a single piece of fabric, which is bojagi, to wrap presents or um, gifts, nicely present. That is a type of bojagi art. But the thing that I do is uh, making bojagi and using bojagi and teaching bojagi. And there are so many ways to make bojagi. You can use single piece of fabric, square or rectangular fabric, or you can put small pieces together and make it into a big or pretty style or design the bojagi, which is called the chogakbo. Chogak means small piece. And bo means bojagi. So jogakbo is a bojagi made out of scraps of fabrics. Is there traditional patterns within bojagi and modern patterns within bojagi? Like I'm looking behind you and that looks like almost a dead ringer for a modern quilt. Is there different styles? Traditionally, you can see 
very geometrical pre-designed patterns like the one that you are seeing behind me. And also you can see free-formed um, patchwork bujagi that was started with the scraps of fabrics. So people wanted to try to use the scraps of fabrics when they have leftover from making garments or beddings or everyday good. They didn't want to throw away remnants. So they save them until they have plenty of colors and shapes and sizes and then put together and make it into something that they can use or they can enjoy. Those kind of chogakpo, patchwork bojagi, you can see lots of free-formed bojagi. And traditionally, there are patterns like pinwheels and rainbows, which is um, very close to log cabin. And you can see pretty points and you can see yoiju which is a um, cathedral window pattern too. So those are all pre-designed and well thought before they construct. So traditionally, you can see both pre-designed bujagi and free-form bujagi. And nowadays, people use traditional techniques and thoughts, and sometimes they apply their own interpretation. I like to make traditional style bujagi, but also I like to make something that can express my own thoughts. So sometimes I use fabrics that has previous life and make into something. And sometimes I um, dye fabrics so I can get my own colors. And sometimes I cut from old Korean garment that I was keeping and collecting and make into something. So at the heart of the bajagi that I know is that flat felled, well, I would call it a flat felled seam. Like your result almost looks like it's, you can see it from both sides. There's no, no right. front and no back. Exactly. How many types of other stitches are there to be used? It's not an exact number, but there are many techniques and some sort of that flat felt seam is one of the bujagi technique that um, people see and recognize because it has a characteristic of sheer and transparent and reversible or front and back are exactly the same finish, right? That is one technique. And I recently made a book of bujagi making, so mm -hmm. which is a stitch sampler book. And I think I have more than 15, 16 stitch techniques. So homjil is running stitch. Kamchimjil is whip stitch. Samsol is that flat fell seam technique. And tongsol is a French seam. I think it's the stitching technique is universal. We use pretty similar things, but have different names. When you see bojagi, there are three decorative uh, back stitches. It is called the setam sangchim that was used to hold two layers of fabrics together and decorate the edge at the same time and things like that. So there are many different techniques. You've probably had to become a historian digging into all the history because people have so many questions about it. But was it originally designed to be utilitarian or was it always decorative? It has both aspects. When you see chogakpo, patchwork bojagi, using some sort of the flat fell seam, most of them are utilitarian purpose because people wanted to use and reuse, recycle fabrics to make something that they can use to hold or to cover or to store things. So those are utilitarian purpose bujagi. And there are some elaborate designed bujagi that was used for special occasions, like religious rituals or happy occasions like weddings and birthdays and the New Year's Day. So those are the ones um, that show elaborate techniques and surface decorated with embroidery or a lot of stitches. Bojagi that was made for royal palace purpose, there's no chokak for patchwork bojagi at all because they didn't need to care of um, materials. They use whatever they can use. Those kind of bojagi are very elaborate 
and you can see the brand new materials and gold thread, gold leaf and silk dress like that. When did you slide from doing the bajagi into teaching the bajagi? I moved to California uh, with six month old baby. And this is new country, new language, new way of life. So it took me several years to settle down and get used to it. And when I finally have time, I started making bojagi. 2004, Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, they have a special program to have local artists to show traditional art. So that was first time that I packed all my bojagi and went to the museum and showed my bojagi to museum visitors. And people wanted to see more and curious about how to make. So they asked me to teach how to make bojagi. So that's how I started. I gradually started to teaching bojagi to art centers and museums and quilt guilds and artist groups. You've taught so many students. What do you find the part of bojagi that they are attracted to the most? I think people are inspired by colors or some constructions and Bujagi is ancient craft tradition, but it's very modern when you see it. Most of my work I make by hand, hand stitch. Sometimes that attracts people because nowadays people are used to use a um, sewing machine and hand stitching can be very slow, but very meditative, keeps your mind clear and People can find peace of mind. And I emphasize um, every stitch is wish for someone's happiness by the tradition. And I share that thoughts to people too. It's interesting that you say it's both history and modern because that was my reaction looking at all these pictures. You could see, oh, this has been done for a long time. There's a history in this. But it was so delightful, especially the ones that you could see through, the translucent ones. Like they just, the colors just popped and they were just so delightful to look at. As a beginner, what would you say the most important thing for me to know about it? What what do people struggle with that I need to, to know going in? For example, when you see that translucent to one single layer bujagi with um, some sort of technique, people try to look both sides and try to figure it out how it was made. If you know how to, the the order of how to start and have a little bit of patience, then you can do it. It's not that hard. We are not trying to uh, make perfection out of making um, bojagi. Every single stitches can be something good, like good wishes that you can imbue to your bojagi. It's not the purpose of making bojagi or making bojagi is not to make perfect stitch. So since we are working with hand, we try to find peace of mind by doing this repeating uh, of hand stitching. I'm sure you've had a lot of quilters attracted to bojagi. Have you ever quilted? Actually, the one behind me, that small piece is a quilt. Yeah, I was drawn to quilts and um, took some classes and made some small pieces to experiment. Yeah, I'm not an expert, but I'm, I love to learn. Is there a tradition of sandwiching bujagi with a batting and a backing and making a heavier blanket? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so bujagi um, is such a broad term, so it covers so many things. It can be one layer, it can be double layer, it can be quilted. Those kind of bojagi were um, used for keeping food warm and sometimes um, cover the food table. So you can see the sandwich style bojagi that it can be called nubipo, quilt. Nubi is quilt in Korean. You don't see that many um, bojagi, but you can see it. And I um, have another um, technique that I love to share is sexil nubi. And sexil means colorful dress and nubi is quilting. And you can see 
not a big project, but small utilitarian pieces such as pouches and covers and glasses, cases like that. And that technique in between two layers of fabric, I put twisted mulberry paper cord. So instead of cotton or wool bedding, Korean people used paper, cut paper into strips and twist it so it can be turned into a cord and then stitch in between two layers. Can you machine sew bujagi? Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. So uh, in all the days, people made everything by hand. During some time period, um, machine-made bujagi was a symbol of um, status or showing their wealth because I'm afford to have sewing machine in my household, which is like early 19th century or 20th century, I think. And nowadays, people make uh, bojagi out of sewing machine too. And I sometimes make um, machine sewn bojagi too, so I can tell people, you can do this. Have your favorite colors changed as you become better and better at your craft? I think favorite color changes by the mood. So even though I have um, sets of um, neutral color palette as my uh, favorite, sometimes I am drawn to bright orange or bright yellow like that. I don't know. But recently, um, one of my work was shown at the Asian Art Museum, and um, I went there with friends who know me well. And one of friends said, oh, I can tell that's your piece by the colors. And that is not um, the neutral color at all. That was mostly uh, lavender purple color, but she somehow saw me from there. What is your favorite project that you've made so far? A couple of years ago, I made a big bojagi that I used um, materials from Korea. And those materials are the ones that I got from the antique store. All the materials like indigo dyed cotton and uh, safflower dyed linens and rainy. And it was folded for a long time. So you can see the color was faded. So I thought, oh, that is just telling me the time and history from that fabric was lived. So I bought those and I dyed some materials and made into a big, big bojagi, chogakbo. And uh, that is lovely piece that I can think of. All the memories and the times that I never lived, but fabric has. Do you label your pieces? Mm -hmm. Labeling is not the thing that I am used to, but in order to submit the work to the exhibit or quilt show, you have to make a label, right? If you're doing it to a show, there's all that information um, that you're required to put in a label. So Mm -hmm. when you do it yourself, are you just putting your name? Most of the time I use red thread, red silk thread to embroider my name. So that um, looks just like a chop that you can see from traditional Korean paintings or calligraphy. Now, I understand that you use all types of fabric. You're, you're not just using traditional fabrics. Everything goes. What is your favorite type of fabric to use? Again, this is very challenging question. Are the fabrics will look at me? But um, my favorite fabric um, that I use is rainy. Rainy is uh, moshi in Korean language. And it's a best fiber from rainy plant and it has very natural looking uh, finish when you uh, make hojagi out of it and it's not uh, transparent but it can give you translucent effect when you finish making chogakbo out of mushi. Traditionally mushi raimi was used for summer clothing because it has a little bit of strength and structure, but the air goes through the fabric. So do you have a sewing group of other bujagi artists that you like to work with, or do you work all on your own? 
I work my own, but I have really good friend who does the same thing, just like me. And sometimes we um, get together and share the thoughts. Do you have the same problem that quilters have and that you buy way too much fabric than you'll ever need? Yeah. So beginning of this year, I was thinking, oh, I think I shouldn't buy any more until I use all the materials in my um, sewing room. Yes, I do have a lot of materials and I still keep buying materials because I have to teach classes and make uh, kits for my students. But I try not to buy uh, materials for myself, maybe for this year. I don't know if I can keep that promise <laughs> with me or not. But yes, I do have a lot of materials and I will have to use them all. I loved your, your story about the, I, I think you called it the seven sisters when you were talking mm -hmm. about your seven tool. friends. <laughs> yes. Seven friends. So those seven friends, um, there is a story in old Korea. There are seven friends of um, the lady. Women are not, were not allowed to go outside freely. They were told and um, they supposed to stay in the house all the time, especially when you are a uh, upper class uh, woman. Restriction is stronger. And the lady who had seven friends, which is needle and dread and ruler, scissors and big iron and small iron for a corner and thimble. Those are seven friends. So seven friends were arguing while the lady was taking a nap. I'm the best because I can do this. I'm the best because I can do this. At the end of the story, the um, thimble lady, she is the oldest amongst the seven friends. And she is saying, we all are do doing what we can do for the lady. So I use that story um, when I talk about the tools and materials. Of course, we are living in 21st century. So I made more friends such as rotary cutters and hair markers and cutting mats like that. Now you mentioned the thimble. Do you mm -hmm. use the same shape of a thimble that we use uh, in quilting? It's pretty similar shape, but it's slightly bigger. The thimble that I make and use sometimes is made out of scraps of fabrics. I put pieces together to make jogakbo style outside. I put seven layers of muslin and mulberry paper so I can have a little bit of strength and stiffness. And then I put pieces together. I have my thimble in here and um, this is the one that I put together by piecing small bits of silk fabrics. Oh wow. And after I put pieces together to make front and back two layers, inside is stuffed with seven layers of muslin and mulberry paper hanji using the um, paste and I put two shapes together using a special technique called satugi. It's elongated cross stitch that you can put finished edge together. Do you have pieces or projects of bojagi that are more precious than others? I grew up with seeing bojagi every day in, in daily life, so I didn't value much. But I have some bojagi that is very meaningful, which is um, most bojagi are from my uh, own wedding. So um, I met my husband in college. So... It's not traditional or old way of uh, matchmaking or parents decide the spouse. But when we uh, told our parents we will get married, his parents and my parents, they wanted to keep all the traditions. So they exchanged the uh, letter before we get married. Bridegroom's um, parents send letter and saju, which is um, four pillars of a person's day of uh, birth and month and year and the time. And Koreans believe that destines someone's fate. 
So it is very important to exchange or show um, bridegrooms saju before they get married so they can predict this marriage will last uh, happily ever. My husband's father wrote a letter and uh, wrote saju and wrapped in special pojagi and sent it to my parents. And my father, he practiced calligraphy uh, all the time. So he um, wrote a letter back and um, sent uh, the good days for the wedding. That is the thing that um, Bryce family choose. So they exchanged those letters before we get married. And it was nicely wrapped in pojagi. And when, on wedding day, bridegroom is supposed to bring wooden goose or geese, a pair of goose um, to the wedding table. And that signifies um, they want to have a good, long, happy marriage. So those um, giragi, wooden goose were wrapped in a special pojagi. And yeah, we follow that tradition too. And my mother-in-law sent me some wedding presents wrapped in a special pojagi. So I keep all the pojagi with me, including all the um, documents and letters. And those are very important and um, precious pojagi that I have. If my um, daughter gets married sometime, I'd love to follow the same tradition too. That sounds like a lovely tradition. I hear you used to, before COVID, you ran tours to Mm -hmm. Korea to bring people to study more of Bujagi and Korean culture. What did you learn on those trips? As I make and share Bujagi, a lot of people have interest in not only Bujagi, but uh, Korean culture and history of textile. So I made a Korea textile tour and we traveled together to visit museums and galleries and artists and took workshops and see the museum. People who travel with me have um, great interest in not only textile traditions or things or arts, but also culture. And we didn't expect much or recognize until the moment, but um, people build a strong friendship out of um, traveling. So that is one good thing that I learned. I feel great because uh, I rediscover the culture and tradition that I grew up with. I thought I knew a lot, but it was not. I was not. I left my country when I was in 20s. When back to Korea with people and that gave me new eyes to see traditions and culture and for me it was it is good chance to relearn my culture and tradition so um, when I was young um, I, I studied clothing and textile and fashion design and I always wanted to see and make and pursue my passion to Western style things. And I never knew that I will do Pujagi and come back to Korea with the people who want to see Korean textile traditions. Thing that um, Korean moms are saying to their um, children, you will understand me when you become a mother. (laughs) I think my mother said that to me a couple of times too. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) That's totally true, I think. So when you go on your travels, are you going back to where you originated from in Korea? Or are you going to different regions? I grew up in Seoul, which is capital city. And I take people to Seoul first and we stay there. But I also take people to different parts of Korea. Some parts I already been, some parts I never been either. And we discover new things over there and traditions that I never knew of, which is great. So um, in 2018, we stayed in a small city called Andong, which is my husband's hometown, but I don't know much about that. But that is the town well known with their tradition of making hemp fabric. So I took people there and we stayed in the traditional Hanok Korean house 
and learned about that hemp making tradition, which was fascinating. If I can resume my tour soon, then I have a list of places to go. And one of them is the place in southwest part of Korea. And there is a master who does Korean traditional indigo dyeing. Exciting. So if people want to get on your wait list or they want to take a class with you, how do they get a hold of you? Emailing is the best way to reach me. So in my website, um, there's information that um, people can email me. My website is www.youngminli.com. And my email is young at youngminli.com. On Instagram, um, my account is youngminli underscore bojagi. And the Korea Textile Tour is Korea Textile Tour. Thank you so much for being on the show, Young Min. This has been lovely. I've learned so much and I am anxious to get started. That sounds lovely. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure to meet you and talk about Bojagi. I hope you've enjoyed my interview with Young Min Lee. As our world opens up again, Bajagi might just be the slow sewing technique you'll need to keep it in balance. If you want to see and learn more about the Bajagi classes Young Min teaches or sign up for our next textile tour, I'll have links to her website, social media, and emails in the notes below. Next up on Karen's Quilt Circle is Sarah Lawson of the YouTube channel So Sweetness. And we will be talking about bag making big bags, small bags, and everything in between. And you don't want to miss it, so be sure to subscribe. The next time you're in your sewing room, be sure to have Karen's Quilt Circle playing in the background. I have interviewed so many amazing people on the show. Let one inspire you. And check out my latest video. So take care, and I'll see you next time.